Welcome to Gut Savior. Questions I'm frequently asked, and I'm going to try and answer them one by one. So, number one, many of our listeners feel overwhelmed by health information online. How can they separate fact from the myth or fiction and feel empowered to make educated decisions? A very good question. So, information is out there everywhere, and there is information with misinformation. I would recommend people to actually go and look at the source of information. So, you find out if it is authentic sources, research or data-based, good studies, not low caliber or the low value high caliber studies and good publication journals hospitals and universities which have a name they often put out information that are worth looking at and follow so i would look at the source of information then when you go to the instagram look at the person uh, background information and see if there is any industry sponsorship or pharmaceutical backup they have that information would not be completely valid or authentic. Then again, be very careful. If it looks and sounds too good to be true, then it is. And then you are on the right track to avoid that kind of information. Especially like if they are saying that you can solve this problem within few seconds, within few minutes, it barely absorbs into your system any medication or supplement that you take. It won't even be absorbed within a few seconds to minutes. So insta relief kind of information you have to be careful with see that if they're trying to sell some product to you and if they have biases and they're not disclosing information then i would be hesitant to follow such lead question number two if someone has been told their health condition is out of their control what role does education play in helping them reclaiming hope and agency education is everything and education is not just your schooling or your college or your post-grad. Education is a lifelong process. We know that. So trying to understand more the mechanisms. When I explain the mechanisms on the drawing board, on the whiteboard, to my patients, they understand and they beg that. This is the first time somebody took time to explain, draw pictures, connections, the physiology. I mean, we, we cannot just downplay this because it's a very, very important fact that if you understand the mechanisms of your body, you are more than willing to feel that you have the agency now, that you have the power to change, that you have a power, that you have resources to make that positive change that you were waiting for. Question Question number three, for listeners who want to prevent chronic illnesses like diabetes or heart disease, what are the first key things they should learn about nutrition and lifestyle? It's a given fact to avoid or to prevent diabetes and heart diseases. You have to take steps from the very beginning. And I'm afraid very beginning means from early childhood. So you will notice that younger and younger generations are now having significant problems with obesity, with diabetes. We are having in our clinic 15 year olds with obesity and diabetes and fatty liver. So it's very, very common. And what has happened is we have reduced fiber in our diet over the last 50 years. From beginning 60 years ago, we consumed 50 to 60 grams of fiber in a day. Today we are 18 to 20 grams a day. So you see that what fiber does is actually helps prevent diabetes because it does glycemic control or better insulin sensitivity. So it stops insulin resistance. So if you have the means and the knowledge now to take such steps, why not? Food that are prebiotics, which are soluble fiber, that will actually help you prevent colon cancer, heart disease, blood pressure issues, glucose control. Then you need nuts and seeds, you need lentils, you need chickpeas, you need beans, black beans. They have all have significant antioxidants that not only just clear up inflammation, but also prevent these significant chronic illnesses by changing your gut microbiome. This is how it all helps. So I would definitely pay attention to those measures and also create an environment in your home when your children are involved with you in cleaning vegetables and chopping vegetables in in creating these using nuts and seeds for different kind of sweets that you can prepare at home using
using honey and avoiding refined sugar, avoiding all sorts of artificial sugar that have now been associated with dementia. These are the steps. If we don't take it right in early stages of our life, then we are not a good model to our children and we are doing a great disservice to our children and for our future. So the next question is, education often feels technical or complicated. How can everyday people learn from about gut health and microbiome in ways that feel simple and doable? Yes, that is a big challenge. That is one of the reasons after so many years, I decided to come on Instagram and start doing this by simplifying the complex issues. That has been my singular mission to transfer knowledge in a way that everybody could understand, even at the elementary school level, people can understand. It is easy to understand gut microbiome. If a woman has a baby in the belly, right? In the uterus, if the woman is pregnant, she takes care of so many things. She always thinks about the baby first, like I'm going to not drink this. I'm going to avoid alcohol. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do reasonable exercises. No, I cannot eat that. It is not good for the baby. No, I cannot smoke. So all of these things that this woman realizes. And if I tell you that we have each been given 100 trillion beneficial bacteria, which are dying left and right, seriously, because of all the ultra processed food we're eating, because of the high fat kind of diet that we're using, because of all these meat products, which are processed, all this chips and cookies and crackers, which are which have all sorts of emulsifiers and agents that are harmful to our gut bacteria and they're dying and we're letting them die. Even though we know that this beneficial bacteria eventually, if they are fed right, if they're given enough of fiber, they are going to produce such wonderful golden value of gold nutrients like butyrate that are going to go into our system and cure us, prevent heart disease prevent diabetes, prevent high blood pressure and colon cancer. And we're still letting these babies inside us die. So this is what I try to synthesize information. I try to distill it down to very simple facts and anecdotes and stories and similes and metaphors that we can relate to, that everybody can relate to and understand that this is important. Gut microbiome is going to determine your destiny. So if that technical knowledge is synthesized by other doctors. I want other people to come on board and start spreading this message. Next question is, many parents in our audience want to raise healthier families. What tools can they use to teach their children about food and health without fear or restriction? This is an essential question, an important question, that fear and restriction leads to more cravings. We know that's the human nature. So what is going to happen is that from early on, you teach your children that they are nutrient-rich food at the then there are nutrient deficient food. There are nutrients that your healthy, friendly gut bacteria enjoy, which will remain healthy and keep you healthy. And there are food that are going to destroy this healthy bacteria. This is how you're going to teach them from early on. You're going to take them to the grocery stores. You're going to keep them in the kitchen around. You're gonna keep the family meetings and get togethers near the kitchen table, okay? That's where the communication is going to be. That's where everybody's participating in washing and chopping dishes, chopping all the vegetables and washing dishes. And, and this is where your talk and communication will be. And you help them prepare snacks and you help them choose the vegetable they want to create their own pickles. Okay. They can choose the vegetable, put water and salt and, and then leave them in the fridge for a few days. You know, you create your own probiotics at home. You let them learn when you go to the grocery store, you pick up the yogurt container and say, can you read the what it says, what does life culture say? It'll be difficult for them to pronounce lactobacillus, acidophilus, and bifidobacterium, bifidum. And then, you know, but they will learn that these are the healthy bacteria that we're going to eat, which are going to make us strong. This is the information you give them. And you keep those healthy food out. Vegetables should be easily accessible. Fruits should be easily accessible. Nuts and seeds, unless they're allergic, should be on the table in the jars. When when they first come back from school, they jump on for some snacks. The healthy snacks is what they get access to. Why should you have bags of potato chips
kids at home? Why should you have cookies and crackers at home easily accessible to them? And then we say that we cannot stop them from eating um, healthy food because they prefer that. They prefer this because that's all they have seen in their lives. As parents, we have to be ultimately responsible and accountable for this change. Some listeners may have been discouraged by failed diets in the past. How can they be educated that personalized nutrition empower them to finally see lasting results? Diets of any kind will eventually fail. That's the nature of it. Diets of any kind, because they don't supply your body with enough nutrients, that is the reason your body eventually craves for something else. The gut bacteria that you are nurturing are going to determine what they want. If you feed them the right stuff, the more nutrient stuff, the more fiber stuff, the more of those species are gonna grow. The good species are gonna grow more and more. And you're gonna be craving more more vegetables and you're going to be craving less sugar because your gut bacteria are now in proportion. So there is a firmicutus and the bacteroids ratio. If that ratio is disturbed, then your gut bacteria are craving for the wrong stuff. Those bacteria are not really very helpful to you. If you feed the right kind of fiber, that and different kind of species and different variety of greens and colorful rainbow color in your diet, then the bacteria, the gut bacteria, that process those, that ferment those are going to be stronger and your whole life is going to change around it. So diet may be helpful for short term, like you go on a keto diet, you know, you lost some weight, but if you keep going it, it's going to miss out on a lot of healthy vegetables and fruits that could be beneficial to you and to your gut bacteria. We have not enough genes. We have only 29, 30,000 genes in our body, but together with the gut microbiome, they have millions of genes. So they can create enzymes that we don't know and we don't know how to ferment because we don't have the ability, but they ferment that fiber for us. So when you take fiber, you're feeding your gut bacteria fiber, not yourself. And that gut bacteria then creates butyrate and other fantastic, beautiful, nutrient-rich molecules that go past your blood and to other parts of your body that makes the skin glow, that reduces the blood pressure, that maintains your diabetes control, that saves the plaques from your heart, from the blood vessels and saves your heart and that prevents the colon cancer in the future for you. When I tell people a handful of nuts can actually reduce, if you take it every day, a handful of nuts and seeds, it reduces your colon cancer risk by 17%. And yet only 11% of the Americans take a handful full of nuts and seed on a daily basis. Why? Education is powerful, but it's easy to feel alone in applying it. What advice would you give to listeners about building supportive environments that reinforce healthy choices? I would say that you associate good eating with the lifestyle. You make it a lifestyle change. When you invite people, you share with them your value. You don't feed them what they want to feed, be fed all the time, but you show them. Like when we talked about diet, get message out from the Mediterranean diet. It has been shown to be significantly beneficial for your heart disease and for your better health in general. So incorporate the values from them. Incorporate values and the recipes from other cultures, from Asian cultures, from Indian cultures. The way they use ingredients. There are seven essential ingredients that all cooking from in Indian recipes were used up until recently. We are also losing it to different kind of food now which are not as nutrient rich. These seven ingredients I remember my mom used to cook and put in every single dish and when I looked at them these seven together were solid anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. You're fixing your leaky gut. These were blood pressure control. They have so many anti-cancer properties, anti-infectious properties that I was blown away. And these were like simple things. This was onion, ginger, turmeric, cumin, and mint cilantro. You have, you use these 
and it's in the form of she prepared the powder and she prepared the paste and she would put it in every dish. And these are the seven magnificent ingredients that have so much power to heal our body. So look at the cultures where few ingredients were used, but they were powerful ingredients and they literally have enormous health benefits. But the plain pizzas and spaghettis and the burgers are not going to cut it for our children. So for those who struggle with motivation, how can learning about the connection between gut health and mental well-being inspire them to take action? This is a very, very important question. Gut and health, the mental health are so closely connected. We know now it is a gut-brain connection or the gut-brain axis. And many of these conditions like irritable bowel syndrome and chronic functional constipation, they have been known now that it's a disconnection between the gut and the brain. So we have started calling it DGBI or disorders of the gut-brain interaction. And they fall under these categories, the irritable bowel syndrome. But you will also be surprised to understand the gut-brain axis is what determines irritable bowels in the gut, but it also determines anxiety and depression disorders in the brain. There is a 60 to 70% chance if you have one, you'll have another. If you have IBS, you're going to have anxiety. If you have anxiety, you're going to have IBS. There's a 60 to 70% chance. Why? Because they depend on the same molecular and chemicals, the same molecules and the molecular mechanisms that work between the gut and the brain. They are the same hormones, the chemical messenger like serotonin, acetylcholine, they work between the brain and the gut. That's why the gut is now known as the second brain because it instinctively feels it. It can work independently sometimes even without much information from the brain. But it constantly sends information and the gut microbiome are the ones who are helping these messages transfer to the brain. That we are unhappy, so you're going to be unhappy. If gut bacteria are unhappy, it sends these messages and your anxiety and depression can get worse with not good food and fiber in your body. It's such fascinating discovery and there's so much more we have to learn. It's at a very early stage, but we now know that if your gut bacteria are healthy, your gut friendly bacteria are healthy, your mood is going to be more stable because it just passes through the nerves. The messages are conveyed straight to your amygdala, straight to your parts of the brain which are responsible for happiness for your good mood. So I'm going to see if there are any other questions and I'm going to address them. Many of our listeners are busy professionals. How can education about small everyday habits empower them to make realistic lifestyle changes? Again, good question. Because they are being busy means you have to make better plans, which means the food has to be prioritized. If you are not ready for snacking with the right snacks, you're going to snack on the nutrient poor food okay rather than nutrient rich food so in the morning when you're leaving do you have a plan like in the afternoon if i'm gonna get sudden cravings do you have a healthy snack ready for yourself this much you can do before you sleep and keep it paired in the fridge for yourself and for your children if you're not prepared you're gonna run into an environment where there's donuts all around you there are sweets all around you there's food that is not going to be very helpful to you and you're going to spoil your day plan ahead that if i'm going to get a little craving in the afternoon my healthy snack is ready with me and then i'm going to drink plenty of water with that so yes busy professionals will have to have better planning now and better planning for yourself and better planning for your children with that i'm going to end this session and um, really always always enjoy taking your questions and comments please feel free to visit gutsavior.co for any other information that you need and i'd be happy i'm very happy since i've started this instagram almost 10 months ago i've had so much happiness by trying to deliver the messages in ways that people can understand and i'm so proud i have no industry backing i have no pharmaceutical backing i've been approached many times but i've said no because my message won't be pure and it won't be based on evidence and based on good published literature. So thank you again for visiting. This is Dr. Sal from Gut Savior.